This is the story about a river, the Rio Grande, which once upon a time was teeming with minnows. Not just any minnows, a very specific type called the Rio Grande silvery minnow. At first glance, they're nothing to write home about. But to Colleen Caldwell, an instructor for NMSU's Department of Fish, Wildlife, and Conservation Ecology, they are a marvel of nature. It's a simple little silver fish. Uh, most folks don't think it's very charismatic, but I do. It has an interesting biology. It's important in that it acts as a, it's an important forage fish for other larger fish that, uh, that live throughout the middle of the ground. So, and it's important as a food base for our migratory birds and waterfowl that stop over. So it's an important in terms of uh, how it fits within a, a food web, an aquatic food web. But two decades ago, that intricate food web in the Rio Grande began to unravel. The silvery minnows, which historically outnumbered other fish in the Rio, started to disappear. We've noticed that it started to decline very quickly in our, in our yearly, uh, every few years we'd go out and we'd sample, we would monitor the river, and it turned out to be, uh, used to be one of the most predominant species and it, it declined precipitously. It's, we consider it the yellow canary. Uh, a, a species of bird that the miners used to bring into the coal mines and when CO2 levels got to be so low the canary would die. And so we think of the Rio Grande silvery minnow as our sort of our yellow canary for the middle of Rio Grande. It tells us a little bit about the, the health of that river system. And it turns out the river was not very healthy thanks mainly to, you guessed it, human intervention. It's a combination of factors, we believe. A combination that uh, has to do with uh, habitat alteration, um, some habitat destruction and alteration, as well as the introduction of non-native fishes, which outcompete and hybridize with the species, possibly. Uh, we've altered the habitat so severely, so much so, that the species that once thrived and used to be one of the largest endemic uh, species in the middle Rio Grande has now been almost nearly extirpated, eliminated from its habitat. The depopulation was so severe that the Rio Grande silvery minnow's historic range from the river's headwaters to the Gulf of Mexico was reduced by 95%. Survivors hung on in a small section of the middle Rio Grande from Albuquerque to just north of Elephant Butte Lake. In 1994, the Rio Grande silvery minnow was listed as an endangered species. And by the year 2000, there were no silvery minnow eggs produced naturally in the wild. That's when this facility at New Mexico State University came to the rescue. It's called the A Mountain Geothermal Fish Culture and Research Facility. Located in the desert, far from the silvery minnow's natural habitat, it seems like an unlikely spot to help aquatic creatures. It was built in the early 1990s to demonstrate that aquaculture is agriculture, and it turned out to be an ideal place to raise fish and study them, and as it turns out, to save them. It was built specifically in the spot because it tapped into geothermal water. And that's a it's very hot water that bubbles up from about 1,000 feet below. It comes up to the surface and it's about 147 degrees Fahrenheit, enough to really heat some water. Uh, it's used actually throughout the campus in the 90s to heat facilities, to heat the buildings. But we tapped into it up here to actually grow fish all year round. And this is a great place to put fish because it's a greenhouse. And so we have natural light, natural food that grows in the facility. It's great for fish because in cold weather they slow down, stop eating, and don't grow. They need the warm water. These tanks, filled with that geothermally warmed water, are now home to about 7,000 Rio Grande silvery minnows, and they are playing a key role in saving the species. What our, our role is in the big picture is to hold rear what we call a captive broodstock, which are the parents. And we inject them with a, a hormone um, isolated from a carp pituitary. This hormone actually induces the parents, the, the, the male and female, to spawn, giving off eggs. And so we capture, we collect all the eggs, we allow them to hatch, and then we ship the larvae, which are about a millimeter to two millimeters in length. We ship them to federal facilities where they're held in ponds for grow out, and then those fish then are released into the wild. But to accomplish that requires creating an environment in these tanks in which the fish can thrive. 
The water in the tanks is recycled, so it's not wasted. But as a result, it has to be carefully filtered to remove uneaten food and nitrogen byproducts produced by the fish. The facility uses filters and ultraviolet sterilizers to do the job. This system filters out these two large tanks and the two tanks in the back, the two smaller ones. And the water rises up to the standpipes in the middle and then comes down into here. And from here, this pump pumps it into the bead filter. And this has a bunch of what we call bio beads. And there's pretty much, it's just a haven for bacteria, nitrifying bacteria. So there's not so much nitrogen in the water. And then it comes back out through these pipes and back in through the spray bars. For the fish to thrive, the water also needs to be properly oxygenated. Every morning and afternoon, Caldwell takes readings to check the water's oxygen level and temperature. This species of fish requires moderate levels of dissolved oxygen because of where they evolved in the middle of Rio Grande. They're used to fairly uh, low to medium dissolved oxygen levels that range from, say, 5 to 7 part per million. But here at this facility, because of the density of fish within the tanks, we try to keep oxygen, uh, oxygen levels fairly high. Special air lifts are used to provide the oxygen that the fish require. These are really nice in that the design is that it forces the uh, aerated water in a, a, a circular fashion. So it gives the fish actually a, a flow to actually swim against, which is really good. It keeps them from being couch potatoes so that they're swimming and, and, and staying in good shape. And it's not just the environment that must be fussed over. This is a diet that we developed here at the facility. Equally as important um, nice is the kind of food protein. the fish are fed. It's a cyprinid. It requires a combination of feed. It's considered an herbivore, but truly it's omnivorous in that it, it likes to eat a variety of feed types, from small little crustacea or zooplankton in the water, as to, say, small algal cells, algae. It will nibble all day long, given the opportunity, and the greenhouse is excellent. That allows for these small crustacea, these zooplankton, these algae to, to, to grow throughout the year. And the warm water keeps its natural food source going. But we supplement that with a diet that we develop through studies through research here and that diet it really provides the vitamins that these fish need in captivity as well as a rounded diet of additional uh, algae and some some protein it took four years to develop the special diet it's a lot better than fish food you can buy in stores which can sometimes be old and lack certain nutrients that the silvery minnows need. Um, it's got a nice blend of protein. Uh, we have squid meal. Uh, there's quite a bit of uh, a fish meal in here because fish do well when they eat other fish. And, um, and, a, and a, di a vitamin, a, what we call a vitamin pack, and that helps supplement what these fish get naturally here in the greenhouse. The special diet keeps diseases under control prevents spinal deformities, and results in quality fertilized eggs. But with the Rio Grande silvery minnow now endangered in the wild, it's also important to maintain the genetic integrity of the species. That's why Heidi Atwood, a research biologist, is especially attentive to this very special group of minnows. That's a, a nice sized silver minnow. They don't usually live that long. Indeed they don't. These minnows, hatched in 2002, are the last to be born from eggs in the wild. They are now six years old, an unheard of lifespan for a silvery minnow. And genetically, because their parents lived in the wild, they are worth their weight in gold. Even at their advanced age, they can still produce eggs and thus help keep the species being returned to the river pure. And it is the river that is the eventual destination of the silvery minnows that are hatched here. And since the Rio Grande is still not a very healthy place for fish, their chances of survival are iffy. What we try to do is anticipate 
the, the fish's needs. When water flows down the river, and it's in the river full time, which will be uh, September, October, we'll actually place these fish, once they get to a certain size, into the river when water conditions are optimal for these fish to survive through the winter. So there's really no place that we're modifying and restoring in terms of habitat for the river, for the silvery minnow. Uh, what we do have though is the several propagation facilities all along the river as well as here that actually hold the fish, keep these fish in captivity until conditions do improve. And it's, it's sporadic. Conditions improve in the river uh, on a seasonal basis. We put the fish out there and say good luck. We're currently investigating placing the fish in what we call the Big Bend area. Which the species is not there, but it has, we think, it has lived there at one time. And we think that might be a good location to put the species, essentially kind of spread our eggs amongst different baskets. So the Big Bend area of the Rio Grande, as well as the middle Rio Grande, uh, the, the chances of it doing well and thriving will depend on how that river is continued to be managed. As long as there's water in the river, the fish do well. When water's pulled out for, for needs, human needs, then the, the water levels decline and obviously there's no room for the fish. So it's, it depends, for the future of the fish is dependent upon the, the future needs of our water resources. 53. Their future also depends on ensuring that more people are trained in how to preserve species of fish. That's why this facility hires students to help with the research here. 